All right, Alan, you are 99% broke, aren't you? I don't know. What are you talking about? Oh, it's time to do the webinar. We have a lot of guests from CPA Academy and a lot of other people, and you're embarrassing me. Oh, and get your hand off my neck. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, everybody, this is Alan Gassman. He's a very mediocre presenter. There's probably better things you can do, and he keeps moving his mouth. Well, you keep moving your mouth. Well, you keep moving your mouth. Okay. All right. Go away. Okay. Okay. I'll work on some trusts now and some estates and clean up this mess of an office. Thank you. All right. It is January, oh, July 23rd, 2022. And this presentation is the Maui Mastermind Member's Guide to Business and Estate Planning Law. And if you saw the preview, I played a little video by uh, David Finkel of Maui Mastermind. I give him credit for helping in the design of a lot of these materials and helping me understand the uh, psychology of an entrepreneur, which I pretend to be from time to time. So we are on uh, the platform here. If you enrolled through CPA Academy, you are going to get one CPA, CPE credit whether you deserve it or not, as long as you answer the polling questions. And the answer is always all of the above. So as soon as you answer those, we can go to the next thing. If you are a CPA or accountant and you want CPE credit and you went through our portal, then you won't get the CPE credit. So you could go ahead and sign off now, sign on through cpa.org, et cetera, et cetera. To ask a question, you can email me at agasman at gasmanpa.com and I'll answer by email. Or you can put go to the question, the inverted pyramid, and type in your question, and I will answer it if I know the answer. If I don't know the answer, I will pretend that I did not see it. Next week, I will be presenting 10 estate plans reviewed. We'll be going through the detail of 10 different estate plans, most of them fairly recent, uh, some estate tax plans, some asset protection plans, some second marriage plans. We will cover it all. Then we're going to be running numbers on estate and charitable planning on August 6th. And then we'll be talking about fundamentals of estate tax planning August 13 and August 20, SLAT and strategies. So we will just keep them coming. You may subscribe to our Thursday report. It is absolutely free and almost worth it. And we've got, if you want to see some of these articles, you can just uh, Google Gassman Thursday report, July 7, and you'll be able to read uh, these articles. So enough with the, fate, with the shameless self-promotion. I'm going to dig right in here to a presentation called Business Law 101 which I gave in Tampa, Florida many years ago. I had more hair there then and probably more intelligence as well. Let's come up with a good quote. Anyone who thinks talk is cheap should get some legal advice. Okay, I like that one. David Porter said, litigation is the basic legal right which guarantees every corporation its decade in court. And that's what we want to avoid, that decade in court. So I do want to start off, we've got about half accountants here today and about half tax lawyers, lawyers, and business owners and professionals. And I want to point out that a lot of successful people come to me and I can see right off the bat that they would have been more successful if they had a good independent accountant. Mostly these are CPAs. Number one, your accountant hopefully does not sell you investments and can help make sure that you are not buying expensive or improper investments. There are way too many of them out there. Number two, your accountant can help you avoid paying more than the necessary tax and also avoid you going to jail for not paying the necessary taxes. Number three, your accountant can help you avoid making bad decisions. Your accountant hopefully has good business judgment 
or can find you a consultant with good business judgment. So when you make your decisions, you may have a coach or you may have a, a business lawyer, you may have an accountant, you should have all of the above perhaps. Number four, your accountant can make sure that you have appropriate financial statements and reporting, not only from the, the standpoint of having proper financial statements for your bank, but having a dashboard so that you understand where you are with your business. A lot of people come to us and the business is failing and they didn't realize it. And one reason was they didn't even know how to read their beautiful financial statements or no one ever showed them. Number five, are you having appropriate tax return preparation? And quite candidly, one way to find out is maybe to get a second opinion from somebody to read the tax returns and make sure that they are being prepared properly because you don't have time to read them. Maybe you should read them once through and learn what some of these statements are in your tax returns. And number six, know where you are financially and from a tax standpoint. Do you meet with your accountant periodically to talk about where you are? Does your accountant make time to do that? Or is this just like laundry? You drop it off and you pick it up and you sign it and you're not sure what happened. We want a little bit more help and cooperation and caring there. So hopefully this is helpful. If anyone would like a video excerpt on what I just said about why you need a good accountant, let me know. Brittany will slice it and dice it and send it to you. So I hope everyone here has goals. And one purpose of this type of presentation is to help you achieve your goals. But are you looking for creditor protection? Are you looking for tax efficiency? Are you looking for being able to sell this business when the time is right? Are you trying to get protected from a family situation? All of these need to be taken into account in your business planning. And how do you do this? Well, I can tell you this. You don't just watch a video and then go to a website and hire somebody who's not a lawyer and not an accountant. They're too smart to be a lawyer and an accountant. They're gonna to put together your business documents and design for you. You use a team of advisors, a team of advisors who are independent of one another and who care about their specialty and what is going on for you in general. So most of my incredibly successful clients have had advisors who can give them candid feedback on just about anything that comes up. An advisor is a professional friend. They care about you. They not only pretend to care about you, they actually do care about you. So think about that. Your advisors should be educating you. And if they're not, then let them know that this is what you expect. Many people quite honestly do treat us like we are Burger King. I'm going on vacation. Can I stop by the window and sign my will on the way to the airport? Versus, well, when I get back from vacation, can we sit down and make sure I understand what the situation is? David Finkel, who you saw there at the beginning, talks about your A time, your B time, and your C time. And your B time is usually working in your business. Your A time is making important decisions. So think about not only what I, what I discuss here today, but how this is going to fit on you. And the first thing that usually comes to mind during a conference is limiting liability. Have you thought about how to limit your liability? Because quite candidly, a lot of what I do in my uh, professional sphere is counsel people who had it hit the fan and they never thought it would hit the fan and they have the goose with the golden egg, that beautiful design, that beautiful system, that beautiful patent, that beautiful skill, that beautiful reputation, all in one company. And all it takes is one trip and fall or one car accident 
or one angry, nasty person to lose everything or to have a risk of losing everything. So I say in jest, just don't own anything, don't do anything, don't guarantee anything, don't know anything. I know nothing. And you're less likely to be sued. But we want to be smart. And when we look at what you're doing, why are you doing it, and who and what is doing what, you can reduce your risk dramatically in a number of ways. So one question here is, who is the manager? Because I could set up the most beautiful company, and it would limit liability. But if somebody gets hurt, they're going to sue not only the company, but anybody who was doing bad things. If I trip on Main Street in Disney World, I can't sue you because you have stock in Disney. But if you were the manager of Main Street and you were the one who threw the banana peels there that I tripped on, then I will sue you personally. So a lot of times clients come in and they have nine different companies for nine different rental properties and they're the manager of all nine. Well, that's what son-in-laws are for. That's what nephews are for. That's what out-of-state corporations are for. So think about who the real manager is. Many of you know that I have many clients who we will have separate companies, and those separate companies will owe money to another company. We call that equity stripping. We'll talk about that later when we get to the nudity part of the talk. But we also will typically make the manager of a company a Wyoming LLC. Not because David lives in Wyoming and I like to visit him there, although that's true. A Wyoming LLC does not reveal who its manager is. So when they look you up, they see, oh, a Florida company doing business in Florida. The manager is XYZ LLC. I'll go to the Wyoming website and oops, they don't tell me anything. Delaware works the same. Colorado works the same. So, but who is the manager of the Wyoming LLC? Hopefully it's not the one who owns the goose with the golden eggs. So D here, and we'll go over this later, is the alter ego rules, defraudment rules, ostensible partner rules. It's great that I could have three companies owning three properties so that if one person trips and falls in a, in a one company, they can't sue the other two. But did I hold them out on a website as being one company? Did I tell the tenant it was one company by accident? Are they writing checks to one company even though they're dealing with another company? Did I introduce someone as my partner? This is my partner, John. He's my partner. Guess what happens? What, a, what is a partner? A partner is somebody who gets sued when their partner gets sued. So we just want to be careful. And we want to think about primary causes of liability and liabilities that are not covered by insurance. A lot of clients say, I already have plenty of insurance. I'm paying a fortune for insurance. Well, that's good. You need insurance, but insurance doesn't cover a whole lot of things. So we wanna select the proper entity or multiple entities for our businesses and practices. It's not always an S corp. It's not always an LLC taxed as an S corp. There's a there's hundreds of different combinations. Talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. If it's real estate, you typically don't want to be in an S corporation unless you're going to have an insolvency issue. And we really want to divide it up. So you have maybe a real estate LLC, typically taxed as a partnership, and then you have the business operational which is typically an LLC taxed as an S corporation. And then where is the intellectual property? If they sue and get a judgment against the business LLC, do I lose my patent? Do I lose my trademark? Do I lose my website? 
Or is it possible that I could put that in a separate entity and have it licensed to my business entity? And what about if I have a management company that actively manages my business entity? And what if it's a C corporation that may qualify under Internal Revenue Code Section 1202 for the sale of its stock at no or very low capital gain? So what if the profits from the management company are rolled into another active business, such as a billboard advertising company or an active landlord company, and then eventually a publicly traded company buys the management company, or when they buy the family company, they buy the management company at the same time to get the goodwill of the management company and what's allocated to the management company under section 1202 may be tax free. I know no one here wants to save taxes, but someone may be interested. Now, a lot of clients are smart enough, well advised to put together a family LLC or a family limited partnership to protect the family assets from creditors. But then the family limited partnership goes and does something silly like violate the Dodd-Frank Act or invest in a hedge fund that turns out to be a Ponzi scheme with clawback or invest in a business or real estate deal where you're guaranteeing debt and suddenly there's a big judgment against the family partnership. So we would use subsidiary companies to avoid liability there. So let me get to the first polling question. And then I'll go back. So here's the first polling question. This is for the CPAs through CPA Academy. The answer is E, all of the above. Here is the question. See, it's like Jeopardy, except you already won and there's no prize. Corporate liability limitations. So a corporate uh, shell will not protect a negligent manager. It requires adherence to formalities. Is the company actually set up? Is the check an account in the company? Are the employees hired by the company? Are you doing annual minutes? C, it can be buttressed by agreements. What does that mean? That means that, the, that your customers can sign an agreement saying you, that they agree to sign to sue only your company and not your affiliated companies or your officers or directors, unless they do something really, really bad, like host a webinar. And then D, requires appropriate corporate documents. Please don't do this at home. And by our experience, when accountants do corporate documents, they do them wrong, and they violate the law against the unauthorized practice of law. So if your accountant is preparing corporate documents, their malpractice carrier will not cover that beware. But the real answer here is E, all of the above. So Brittany, can I go back to the program or are people still looking? Okay, going back here, I want to show you something that a lot of tax lawyers don't know about because when we take the taxation of reorganizations, the professor covers the A reorg, the B reorg, the C reorg, the D reorg, maybe the E reorg, and then class is over, no one gets to the F reorg. So I want you to go to your accountant and say, Floyd, Mary, what do you think about an F reorg for my company? And they may not know what an F reorg is, but here's what it is. And this is the code section of the day. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, I have a laugh machine too. All right. You have a medical practice, it's an S corporation or a C corporation. It owns the practice or operations, it owns the furniture and the equipment, it owns the real estate, it owns the accounts receivable. It's not very smart, is it? So the doctor comes to you and says, I saw a webinar that said I should get the equipment and furniture and real estate out of the medical practice company. So we need to get that done as soon as possible. And the lawyer or accountant says, you can't do that, you'll trigger gain. Because when you transfer an appreciated asset out of a company, you trigger gain. 
No, you don't. You set up a new parent company. It can be a new S corporation. It could be called Medical Practice Holdings, LLC. It elects to be an S corp. And then you transfer the ownership of the medical practice company to the new parent company. And that is tax-free under 368A1F. I get to charge for it. That's my sound effect. Okay. And then I set up a subsidiary LLC here, which owns the equipment. The transfer does not trigger tax. A subsidiary LLC here that owns the real estate. The transfer does not trigger tax. And now I have the medical practice generally much better protected. A plaintiff lawyer looks at this, well, I'm not going to get any equipment. I'm not going to get any real estate. By the time I get to trial, there probably won't be any accounts receivable. But if you're concerned about the accounts receivable, then you set up a factoring company also owned by the parent company. So you're not going to trigger any income tax, make a high interest rate loan to the factoring company from a family LLC owned partly by the children. This buys the accounts receivable and everyone's happy. Thank you very much. Thank you for the applause. I really appreciate it. So let's go somewhere else now. These are exclusions from liability insurance. So please don't trust liability insurance. One example here, and by the way, you may need glasses. If you see, if you're seeing double here, the double C, double D, you may need glasses. But under F, punitive damages. So you do something really bad, really stupid, punitive damages, your insurance doesn't cover that. Or hazardous waste, or criminal acts, or willful torts. So be careful. Insurance doesn't cover everything. It does not cover punitive damages. And punitive damage awards are not at all unusual. So now, Exceptions to limited liability include guarantees. Now there's two types of guarantees or three types of guarantees. There's, I signed this note along with 96 other people and things went bad and 95 people disappeared. The bank's only coming after me. They have to go after everyone, don't they? No, they only have to go after whoever they want. If you read the guarantee. Okay, I signed a limited guarantee. I'm only responsible for 100, I'm only responsible for 33% of a problem, and there were five of us. So how much could that be? Well, it could be a lot because you didn't read the limited guarantee. It says 33% of the problem plus all the interest, joint and several, plus all the attorney's fees, joint and several. Well, I signed a non-recourse guarantee called a bad person guarantee. They used to be called bad boy guarantees, but I don't think we can say that anymore. So what does that mean? Well, that means that they're going to accuse you of trying to defraud them or trying to divert funds. So if you are on a bad boy guarantee, you need to make sure that you really dot the I's and cross the T's and get not only compiled financial statements, but get at least reviewed financial statements so your CPA firm is watching that like a hawk. So there are limits to limited to liability insurance. Bringing us to polling question number two, and the answer is D as in dog, all of the above. Liability insurance, A, is essential, B, has exceptions, C, can vary significantly from carrier to carrier. And by the way, one agency may have access to this carrier, another agency has access to that carrier, a third agency has influence with the carrier, and then D, all of the above. And what we regularly see is clients who have unknowingly outgrown their liability insurance agency. They start off with State Farm or Nationwide or Allstate, and then they become very big and they don't go to a carrier that specializes in their industry. So sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes it's worthwhile. 
Brittany, are we able to go now? Okay, we have a quick crowd here. We appreciate you very, very much, and you have a great sense of humor. Wow, what a crowd. Thanks so much. Okay, the doctrine of respondeat superior, which means that if I have an employee and that employee goes and runs an errand and hits a Boy Scout on a bicycle. Oh, there's no Boy Scouts anymore, I forgot. Okay, hits someone who used to be a Boy Scout on a bicycle. Then I'm responsible for that. So I'm so glad that Uber now delivers packages. So my employees don't have to go deliver packages. But an independent contractor, I am not responsible for. Now, your accountant, will tell you in a knee-jerk reaction, oh, almost everybody you hire to do anything has to be an employee. And that is true in the eyes of the IRS, but that is not necessarily true in the eyes of your state law. So I can have a relationship with a driver and it is an independent contractor relationship. I pay them by the delivery and they use their car and I schedule them out. You'll find, or a painter. I have a painter who comes and does paint jobs on my rental property. The IRS may require me to consider that person to be an employee, but I can still enter into an independent contractor agreement. But if I do, I'm at risk that if they get hurt and they don't have workers comp, then they may claim they should have been an employee, and then they may sue me for what workers' comp would have given them. So if I'm gonna be safe, I'm gonna require them to set up their own company and to have workers' comp on their own policy so that they're not gonna come and blame me later. So we've been involved with plumbing companies, roofing companies, uh, taxi companies where we put what used to be employees under a separate contractor company, like an employee leasing company, and then they do work for the client's various other companies. So if there's an accident, the lawsuit is definitely gonna be against that employee leasing company, definitely against the company that owns the vehicles, but not so definitely against the company that they're helping, or at least only that company and not all the associated companies. If you have three companies that all do business separately, but they share employees, then you're at risk that one employee in one company could cause liability to all three. So that's where you wanna set up a fourth company. And the fourth company employs them and leases them to the other companies. It should reduce your risk, but it may drive your insurance agent crazy. So you have to think through how you're gonna do this. And even if a person is an independent contractor, if they are operating a dangerous instrumentality, then under the laws of most states, you may not be able to avoid the liability unless they are a true separate company, but you wanna make sure there's plenty of insurance. So, a lot of clients come to us and they've heard about land trusts. And a land trust is a revocable arrangement between the owner of the rights to property and a trustee who holds the title to property. So I could set up the 1245 Court Street Land Trust. Our office is at 1245 Court Street in Clearwater, Florida. We willingly accept gifts from nine to five, Monday through Friday. And I can deed the property to Wyoming LLC as trustee of the 1245 Court Street Land Trust. And now, and then the beneficiary of the 1245 Court Street Land Trust could be me or my company. So now when you go to the courthouse records, you don't know who the owner is. 
So for many clients, and especially uh, high-risk professionals, law enforcement, and celebrities, we will take their home and put it in a land trust with the Wyoming LLC as the trustee. So when they go to the property appraiser website, they only see the Wyoming LLC as trustee. Then when they go to the Wyoming website and they don't see anything. So, but a lot of people think that that land trust will limit liability or save taxes. It will do neither. If I have a trust that I can revoke or amend, the liability is coming straight through to whoever can revoke or amend the trust. And if I have a trust I can revoke or amend, then for income tax purposes, I am considered to be the owner of that trust. But there are ne'er-do-well people, people who don't mind hurting you. They are either ignorant or greedy or a combination thereof, and they will tell you that they have special sauces that allow them to use land trusts and Nevada companies and all sorts of smoke and mirrors to help you save taxes. Typically they are from out of town and they are so smart that they don't have a law degree or an accounting degree, or they're about to lose their law degree or accounting degree. And just be very careful. Talk to an independent lawyer, an independent trustee, one who has a reputation uh, to protect, uh, maybe one who doesn't give silly webinars every Saturday from 11 to noon, and just try to make sure that you're not being sold the wrong bill of goods. Okay, and then F on page 42, give your Doberman to your mother-in-law or father-in-law. Those Dobermans and associated dogs can do a lot of harm please make your next dog a safe dog that will be covered by insurance. Dalmatians, German Shepherds, Do Dobermans, uh, these are pit bulls. These are, you know, I can't counsel you on your personal relationships, but on the dog part, don't get a dangerous dog unless you uh, really need one. Okay, bankruptcy law basics I will cover in a later. Uh, presentation. Page 44. I want to talk a little bit about evidence. Evidence can be very important. You've seen the attorney client privilege issues relating to the January 6th hearings. Well, I don't have to testify. I was the president's lawyer. Well, were you really counseling the president from a legal standpoint, or were you participating in a crime? Because if you were participating in a crime, then the attorney-client privilege doesn't work. And the US Supreme Court has pushed that off farther and said, if you're participating in helping a client avoid creditors and the client ends up in bankruptcy, then the attorney-client privilege may not apply. Or I'm giving you legal advice and you have your next door neighbor who jogs with you listening on the speakerphone, not telling me that because they were just so interested in it. They're not really helping you with your legal case. They were just interested. So you showed them the letters I wrote you too. Well, now that becomes unprivileged. So please remember email stands for evidence mail. And secondly, uh, and I meant to change this slide, do not talk to the government alone. So now there's exceptions to this. For example, if you are in the forest and there's a fire and you need a forest ranger, then you can talk to the government. But in general, if the government comes to you and says, hello, we're doing an investigation and we could use your help. Your answer is fantastic. My lawyer is Jane Doe and she always told me that if I ever had the opportunity to help an investigation, that she would help me help that investigation. So let me get her in touch with you as soon 
as possible. And that's okay. There's nothing, nothing wrong with doing that. If a healthcare plan shows up at your office, or Medicare shows up at your office, or federal investigators show up at your office. If they have a warrant, then you have to do what the warrant says. If they don't have a warrant, then you can politely say, I've always been told not to talk to the government, so uh, I'll get my lawyer with you just as soon as I can. Now, you also have the attorney client privilege with clergy and with your spouse in most states, but in some states and in the federal bankruptcy code, there is no privilege for your communications with a CPA. So if you're gonna to talk to your CPA about a tax matter, it is privileged with the IRS, as long as it's not a criminal issue. But if it's a creditor matter, then what you wanna do is you're, you hire a lawyer and the lawyer drafts a special letter and may charge you for it. And then the lawyer hires the accountant and the accountant is assisting the lawyer. And that's called a Covell letter, K-O-V-E-L-L, -L, because uh, there was a taxpayer named Covell. Unlike Carvel, he did not have an ice cream cone. He had a confidentiality issue. So. I've got more information there and a picture of Sigmund Freud. You can stare at it as long as you like. All right, let's find the next polling question. I did not have a lot of materials on arbitration. And the answer, believe it or not, is E, all of the above. But I'll take you through it. If you get sued or you sue somebody, that normally happens in court and you pay a filing fee to file the lawsuit, and then it's pretty much free. The court system costs a fortune. You pay your lawyers a small fortune, but you don't have to pay the judges much. You don't have to pay the juries much. Or believe me, you shouldn't pay the judges. That can be very dangerous. So there's an alternative where you pay to have arbitration. And I favor arbitration quite often for a few reasons. Number one, it's confidential. And by the way, with American Arbitration Association, you can have an appeal. A lot of lawyers say you can't appeal a wrong arbitration agreement uh, uh, decision. That's not true with American Associate, Arbitration Association. They have an appellate division. B, you avoid unpredictable judges. Judges can be very good, judges can be very mediocre. So with arbitration, they give you a number of arbitrators, and then your side can eliminate some, the other side eliminates some, you end up with somebody who's at least average. Not so much in court. C, you avoid juries, although you can have a, a avoidance of a jury clause anyway. Um, D, it reduces manipulation in court. Lawyers will commonly stall, delay, and manipulate things in court, and judges want to be re-elected and popular among their colleagues, and quite frankly, let the lawyers get away with a lot. Arbitrators typically don't let lawyers get away with that much stuff, so it has to go to court. And especially if it's a personal injury situation, jurors can be very, very generous just for the sake of being generous. Arbitrators can be somewhat generous, but not like a runaway jury. So the answer is, of course, all of the above. And thank you very much for getting the right answer. So now we're going to talk about equity stripping. And this is where you take the value of the asset and you get it out. So here is John with 10 rental houses worth 3 million in his name. So what he might do is take a $2,600,000 mortgage on those houses and owe it to the lenders and then take his $2,600,000 and put it in a creditor protected vehicle, which might be tenancy by the entireties with his spouse and he keeps the rental houses in a separate LLC 
It might be a family limited partnership owned partly by a creditor protection trust. So then somebody trips and falls, they only have $400,000 of equity that they can go after. And there's ways to do this with a lender or ways to do it with a related party lender. So a lot of clients, uh, we go back to that medical practice situation. You go to the accountant, you can say, can my medical practice owe me $500,000? It's got 550,000 worth of assets. Alan says it should just owe me 500. So if somebody gets a, a, a judgment against the medical practice, the money comes out, the money's owed to me and my spouse. Well, the accountant says, sorry, you can't do that, you'll trigger tax. And then you say, well, what about if I do an F reorganization under section 368A1F, the code section of the day? And then could the medical practice owe the parent company? And the accountant says, oh yeah, I forgot. I saw Alan's webinar last weekend and he did mention that. So that's, that's where that comes in. Okay. Item number 10, do you have a shareholder or partnership or buy-sell agreement? What happens if there is a disagreement? Do you go to arbitration? Is there a provision that says what happens if there's a disagreement? What happens if your partner dies? I know you're sad at first, or maybe not so sad, depending upon the situation. But what specifically happens? Do you buy them out? Do you have to support their family for the rest of their lives? Is this set forth in an agreement? Did you read the agreement? Have you updated it? These are really very important questions. So the buy-sell agreement arrangement is uh, discussed in one of our books, The Creditor Protection for Florida Physicians. Think about it. Get your lawyer to send you a sample by sell agreement. There's a lot of what ifs. I could spend a month and a half talking about by sell agreements. Ben Franklin, in his autobiography, said that the reason he was so successful licensing out his printing companies in all the in all of the different colonies was because he was very careful to cover anything that might happen in the license agreement. Ben Franklin was probably America's first franchisor. Those printing companies, he started the first one and then he, he became very well connected with the US government and with the Postmaster General and then he licensed these printing companies and he had careful buy, sell agreements. Okay. Number 11, I sincerely hope that you always enjoy good health, good family, and not being involved with a criminal investigation. It is not a pleasant sight when a client learns that they have been involved in criminal activity, unbeknownst to them, that their best friend, their partner, their boss, whatever you want to call it, was cheating a little bit here and there, really didn't mean much, didn't mean anything terrible, but, you know, was telling the government it was blue and it was really green, uh, hiring people who weren't really able to be hired, uh, stealing a little bit of money here and there, and suddenly a whistleblower shows up and says, I heard that you were doing this, so I have reported you to the US government. And in the healthcare field, under the Whistleblower Act, the government has a certain period of time to respond. And then if they don't, then the whistleblower's law firm will, will file the lawsuit on behalf of the US government and get a hefty percentage of the money that comes in and also interest the government in criminal prosecution as well. So again, when the government comes calling, don't always answer, get representation from a lawyer who specializes in this area. 
and be very, very careful. And by the way, obey the law. Have a lawyer. If you're in the healthcare field, have a healthcare lawyer audit your company once a year to demonstrate that you have every intent to comply with the law. And if something comes up, then it's under attorney client privilege. Please do be careful because when the banks find out that you are being, it, that you're the subject of a criminal investigation, the money dries up and things can go very, very poorly. So just uh, be careful. So number 13, please don't associate with jerks or dishonest people. I know a lot of you are saying, why would a lawyer have to tell me this? And a lot of you are saying, I wish I had known this. But there are people out there who can help you make a lot of money and are really smart and have really good ideas and are terrible people and will get you into a lot of trouble. And the first sign, for those of you who are professionals, the first sign of this is they are not polite to your staff or others. And the second sign is that they are very, very successful and they make sure that you know that they're very, very successful, which may distract you from other things. Now, these folks may be in your church, they may be in your synagogue, they may be very, very successful, they may be very, very pleasant, but try to keep your antenna up because when they go down, you go down with them. And this also, I'll expand this to Ponzi schemes. In all of our careers, we will see a number of Ponzi schemes where give me the money and it's growing, it's going really, really well. Here's a tiny bit of your money back, but why don't you give me more money and find some friends to give me money because this is so good. It's so good, it's earning 11% a year and I really know when to do this and when to do that and all these ice machines are working out great. And then it turns out to be a Ponzi scheme and you lose not only what they're holding, but the bankruptcy court comes back after you if you got more than your pro rata share of profits. So we just wanna be careful. That is called a clawback. So more about business law. When you sign an agreement, and by the way, I have a novel idea for you, and that is consider reading your business agreements because they can be very, very important. So one thing I'll often do is say, well, who's, who, who, who drafted your customer agreement? Oh, I got it from my industry or I got it from a competitor. Well, does it have a clause that says that the customer can't sue you unless you do something really terrible? Um, I don't know. Does it have a clause that requires arbitration so you don't have to be in a public jury trial? Um, I don't know. Does it have a clause that says that if one provision in the agreement is illegal, that doesn't cause the rest of the agreement to not be enforceable whatsoever, which is necessary under the severability rules? Um, I don't know. Does it have an agreement that any litigation would be in your county where you live and not where somebody gets hurt? Um, I don't know. Does it have an agreement that any ambiguity would not be construed against you as the drafter? I don't know. Does it have a provision that says that certain provisions in the agreement survive the closing of any transaction or the being done with doing business? I don't know. Does it have a provision that says that the agreement can be amended orally so the person on the other side can lie about a conversation and get out of the agreement? I don't know. So read the agreement. When I uh, 
speak to new lawyers at conferences and in classes, I, I say print out the agreement and read it. Read every sentence in the agreement. You're not going to read every sentence in the agreement. Tell the client you're not going to read every sentence in the agreement, but you have to be very, very careful. And in business relationships, you have to be doubly careful because it's easy to say, oh, we'll get together and I'll put in the money, you'll put in the work, we'll rent the property here, we'll open up the business, and when things go great, I'll get 62%, you get 38%. That's the easy part. The hard part is if things don't go so great, who's going to handle that? And what if we're not getting along? So I think you see my drift. Part of a well-designed business is well-designed agreements with uh, customers and uh, suppliers, et cetera. Now, here is the next polling question. This is the final polling question. If you're a CPA and you're merely here to get credit, well, you got it. You just have to answer this very easy question, but the answer is not all of the above. The question is, and we will send this to you free of charge, no charge to you, and you can sell it to your friends. Would you like to have A, the book Eight Steps to a Proper Florida Trust and Estate Plan, B, How to Grow Your Medical Practice by David Finkel, Dr. Singh, and me, C, Creditor Protection for Florida Physicians, which covers a lot of business entity planning uh, information, and D, what estate planners and others need to know about bankruptcy. Brittany, do we have sufficient? Okay, we got that done. We are off to the races. So David Finkel and I uh, thought of the biggest mistakes or what David called the 10 stupidest things people do that get them sued. And let's see what they were. This was an article in Inc. Magazine. Number one, Failure to recognize legal threats caused by lack of compliance with the law. There's a really good book called You're Not So Smart, and it says that people don't realize the degree of risk they take. So whatever businesses you're in, you can ask your insurance carrier or your lawyer or a risk consultant to come in and help reduce your risks. And also, by the way, do what your spouse tells you because they've been telling you this a long time. Number two, sever your ties with dishonest people. Lie down with dogs and you will get fleas. Number three, fix or flee from bad relationships. Number four, adhere to high quality standards of conduct, products, and follow through. Don't be a slob. Do a good job care about your customers. If you sincerely care about your customers and care about your employees and care about your suppliers, then maybe you'll make more money, maybe you'll make a little bit less, but you'll be able to sleep at night because you'll be less likely to get sued. Number five, failure to monitor and assure honesty in others. Another thing that your accountant can do for you that I should have put on that list, Brittany, next time we present this, we'll have it on the list is theft proof your business when the checks come in the person who gets the check should not have the ability to tell compute the computer that the check was paid the person who who handles your account that pays building expenses should not be able to write checks and somebody should be carefully seeing what expenses are paid so they don't accidentally have or intentionally pay for their own house while they're paying for your building CPAs know and accountants know how to do this. Number six, plan for Murphy's Law. As you know, Murphy's Law is if something bad can go happen, it, it will. And the corollary is in the worst way at the worst possible time. So remember Apollo 13, NASA always had a backup system. If, if the if the ship did not work, they could come back on the limb. So if the limb didn't work, they could shoot another ship up. Always have your backup systems. 
Number seven, make sure you get good legal and accounting advice. Number eight, go ahead and get a second opinion on your liability and casualty insurance. Number nine, follow good employment law practices. Have an employment lawyer read your manual or have an a employee leasing company that knows what they're doing help you out. Um, and then number 10, implement and maintain proper legal structures. And I do have from our position book, what we call the ABCs of LLCs and other entities. Okay, let me go ahead and answer some questions now. Um, and then after that, I've got even more things we can talk about, but probably we'll just do questions for four minutes. Um, can a factoring company be set up through a retirement plan? I don't think so, Andy. I think a, a retirement plan should not have an active business owned under it and that you would violate the prohibited transaction rules. But I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. Okay, Jesse had a good question. She says, question from Bill Clinton, what is a sexual act? I will decline to answer that under oath. Okay, business people should know not to work or organize in California. It's a taxing proposition. Oh, I like that. California is an expensive place to do business, that's for sure. Okay, um, can you put a business in a credit shelter trust? And the answer is yes, when one spouse dies, you can set up a credit shelter trust like the one here, that's a coincidence. The one you see right there, when the one spouse dies, up to $12,060,000 can go into the Credit Shelter Trust, also known as the Bypass Trust, and it can benefit the surviving spouse without ever being subject to creditor claims or federal estate tax. So the business can go into this, and then the, this, this trust would pay the taxes on the business income, but it would get a deduction if it was paying salaries for employees who are working, and that was a, a very good question. Okay, Catherine says, how can you pay your one-year-old child from an accounting sole proprietor firm? People do say that the child is a model and put the child on a brochure and pay the child and then the child sets up a Roth IRA. Um, to me, that's a little bit aggressive, but people do do it. Uh, Samuel wants to know, can I stay anonymous as a whistleblower? Uh, well, first of all, don't give me your name if you're going to ask me if you're going to be anonymous as a whistleblower. Secondly, I don't think so. My experience with whistleblowers has been that they have not been anonymous. Um, okay, thank you for sharing the this ocean of knowledge every week. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, can I get all three of the physician books? You can get them on Amazon, where I sell at least a book every month. So if you buy two books, you'll double my sales on Amazon. Thank you very much for asking. Okay, the second Murphy's Law Corollary, Murphy was an optimist. I like that one. Okay, uh, if you equity strip, how much equity would you leave? Thank you, Stephen. I like to leave 15 to 20%. I think 15 to 20%, if you have a million dollar building, and you owe a related party a note for uh, 18%, I mean, for 82% of that, that allows the future growth. I think that's uh, pretty safe. I think 20% equity is a uh, pretty safe rule of thumb. Okay, George has a good question. Isn't negligence less than fraud? Uh, why wouldn't a corporation protect a negligent act? Well, if let's let's say that I'm the manager of the company and I decorate the stairway with banana peels because I think they look so nice in the summer. And that's not a fraud, but then somebody breaks their neck on a banana peel. I was personally negligent putting those banana peels there. So that that's why somebody could uh break through on there. Okay, James has one question and then we'll we'll end this up. And if you like, I can come back sometime and do part two. 
But James's question, in Pennsylvania, if you have a true independent contractor who doesn't have workers' comp, payments to them should be included in your workers' comp wages, which is problematic for Schedule C proprietors since they are not employees and cannot get workers' comp for themselves. Okay, well, those of you in Pennsylvania, I'm glad you know that. I wanna mention something else that was in a slide. If you're in a community property state, California, Texas, uh, one of the other community property states, Louisiana, if one spouse gets sued, the creditor can take all of the community property. So you may wanna transmute out of community property. So if you have a married couple that owns a big business and one also drives sports cars, then you may want to go ahead and transmute out of community property treatment. It would not be as good for income tax purposes if one spouse dies, but I think creditor protection may rule the roost there, or you could use a joint exempt step-up trust as far as, as that goes. So um, because I appreciate what David Finkel has uh, done for me and helping me to put these presentations together, understand my audiences, and he's been my business coach, I wanna go ahead and play a video that we filmed on his most recent book, The Freedom Formula. And if you are a professional or an entrepreneur, uh, I can promise you there's a lot of good ideas here. Uh, seeing all of the slides that I did not cover today, we'll definitely do a part two in a couple of months. I do always welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions. And here is the Freedom Formula with David Finkel. Have a fantastic weekend. Do something to improve your business, whatever it is. Hi, this is Alan Gassman, and time for me to introduce my friend David Finkel and his book, The Freedom Formula. But before I do, let me mention some upcoming webinars. September 5th, Ken Crotty's going to be presenting Nuts and Bolts of Florida LLC Law and Practices from 12.30 to 1. September 12th, Michael Lehman, a very, very good not-for-profit lawyer, is going to talk about Form 1023 line by line. And then September 19th, don't miss my friend Colleen Flynn, an excellent employment lawyer with the Johnson Pope Law Firm on hiring employees, 10 practical and legal strategies. Let me now introduce to you David Finkel. David is a nationally and actually internationally recognized author, consultant, and business coach. His company, Maui Mastermind, coaches dozens and dozens and has coached hundreds of successful businesses and entrepreneurs. And today is the launch day for his newest book and most exciting book, The Freedom Formula. So David, congratulations on The Freedom Formula. I know it's been a lot of work and sure. you put a lot of years of dedication into this. How does it feel to be today on the release? <laughs> well, it feels wonderful. I mean, it's a project that's probably taken a decade to write. It's the 11th book, but really what we've been doing has been experimenting with all of our coaching clients, whether they uh, run CPA firms or, or run law firms or, or physicians or manufacturers. And what we've done is we've experimented there about trying to get rid of everything that doesn't help somebody create more value with less time in their business so that we can leave you know the steps that are just those things that make the most difference and work across the largest cross section of people. And so it's been a real, a real joy to do that. It's been fun. So David, tell us a little bit about your about your background. So those of those people on the call who don't know all about you can get a little bit more substance. Sure. I mean, I guess what you call me would be a serial entrepreneur, like a lot of your clients and those who don't know, I'm actually a client of Alan's as well. I've enjoyed having his firm represent me and do great work. No, no soft plug there. It's a hard plug and you deserve it. Alan, your firm has been meticulous and incredibly fast on the turnaround. But that said, I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I've, I've built businesses, I've sold businesses, and that's what I primarily do. And for about 20 years now, um, the business of, that I've most enjoyed have been this idea of coaching. And so we've built Maui Mastermind, a, a coaching business that works with entrepreneurs and business owners of how they can build a business versus owning a job. How do they grow their company, not just in terms of profit, not just in terms of, of gross revenues and margin, but in terms of its owner independence, how can they build a business that has what we call strategic depth? 
and and that's what we've been doing now for a number of years. And I guess I should disclose that you're my coach and that you've been coaching <laughs> me for what two or three years now. That's right. And that I've had a dramatic change in the hours I've worked and the profitability of our law firm, the enjoyment of the law firm. Much of it comes just from your book, Scale, which was the first book you read, and then subsequent books that you've written that I've that I've uh, read and enjoyed. How is this book different? Yeah. So when we talk about the Freedom Forum, the, the biggest thing I had everyone asking me for, they, you know, I, I think one thing I've been known for, Alan, is uh, I'm the person that doesn't tell you what to do. I'm the person that says specifically, here are the steps to do the, 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 the what to do, the, the how to side. And so they said, well, David, I loved your book scale, but it was for the business owner. So I'm sold. I'm doing this stuff. But what do I talk to with my employees? What's the book for my employees? And so when I came across and finally started writing the Freedom Formula, what we did is we wrote the book for the business owner and for his or her key staff. So that rather than the owner being stuck doing all the implementation, here's the book you can give to your team. And it's written in such a way that they can do most of the heavy lifting with you. That's fantastic. And I've ordered one for all of our employees and they're all gonna look forward to receiving it. And I assume you're gonna autograph each of them. <laughs> I absolutely will if you want me to, Alan. It'd be a pleasure to do it. No pressure doing that by asking me that question on the spot. <laughs> so, so, David, I know it takes a long time to write a book, and you have to plan ahead, sure. and you have to you know, really think through. What surprised you the most when you wrote this book? What, 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 what caused you to think differently about something than you thought about before the book was started? It's a great question. So, so Alan, one thing I, I did for this book, which was different, is um, most of the work we had done would be with small and mid-cap companies for, you know, companies that are under $100 million. And so for this book, uh, quite some time ago, when we first started the project, I, I tapped into my Rolodex and I started working with some of the, the autonomous divisions and some of the executive VPs or, or senior VPs at some very large Fortune 50 companies. And what really surprised me was they were incredibly strong on process. They had exceptionally bright people there. I mean, it was across the board uniformly with the teams we coached, they were incredibly smart. But culturally, they had such impediments that they put to their own people creating real value. And I'll give an example. I can't share names because I've, I've got some, anti you know, some confidentiality provisions, but I'll give an example and we'll anonymize it. So I was working with the person who's in charge for a large Fortune 50 integrated manufacturer here in the United States for the division for the United States. He's responsible for all of North America, Canada, all the way down to Mexico. And his comments were, as they kind of shared with it, was they, for example, they did meetings. This is an example of one thing they did, Alan. And so before the meetings, they would want everyone to be up to speed. So they would send out a pre-read before these meetings, which makes perfect sense. These pre-reads though were 50, 60 pages before these meetings, so no one read them. So they would not only send out the pre-reads, which cost a lot of resources to create, but because they knew not everyone would read 50 or 60 pages, they still did all the background on the meetings. So I guess what surprises me was how some of these large multi-billion dollar corporations just screwed it up to make it really difficult for their own staff to create value. Like at that same company, they had some people on the staff who were probably in the mid six figures in terms of salary. And yet when they asked for ways that they could help leverage their time, like sharing some administrative help, which would have been a $60,000 hire to do things like expense reports or arrange travel between several of these executives, the answer was no, which made no sense. They were pulling people away from doing work that was worth in the millions of dollars so they could do work that they could have staffed out at $25 or $30 an hour. And so that was probably the big surprise when I realized, you know what, not only small and mid-cap companies have challenges, the large institutional have different challenges, but they're all related back to how do you It's people on its best uses, on its biggest opportunities. And that's a universal challenge, which is why we wrote the book. Okay. For some reason, the screen locked up when you said, how do you, and then we Got lost it. you again. How do you get your best people, their, your best talent, your best attention, focused on those fewer activities, those fewer projects, those fewer strategies that make the biggest difference? And how do we start to crowd out, design out, staff out, systematize out, the lower value work, which right now, 
and I saw this, I've seen this with my clients. I've seen this with these large enterprises that we worked with as clients during this project. Uniformly and universally, they had a portion of their best, most expensive talent doing just silly things that they shouldn't have been doing. And it cost their firms, if it's a small company, hundreds of thousands of dollars. On these Fortune 50 companies, it's probably a, a, a 50 to $150 million hit just from the things that I directly saw as we worked with them to improve those things. So you just hire great people and then completely get in their way and don't give them any tools. That's right. And, and you institutionalize indirectly that the behavior that matters is they have to look like they're busy. They have to be responsive, even if being responsive means they're going to interrupt high value work for low value junk work. And that's what uniformly is happening across when we work with the client initially. Now, later on, we change that, which is one of the things that the book focuses on. So do you want to take us through the book now and tell us yeah. what we would expect if we read it? Let's do that. So I'm going to share an image, and you tell me, Alan, are you seeing this image here right now on your screen of a, of a gentleman, an executive walking up the staircase of success here of the formula? Okay. Yes. So if you can imagine, this is the formula in, a, in an image version. So there's the, the life success, business success that we all want, whether I'm a, I, I run a law firm and I want to have a balance between doing wonderfully good legal work and, and create value for my clients and have a life, whether I'm a physician running my medical group whether I'm a manufacturer or a service-based business owner, it doesn't matter. We all want to create incredible value for our clients, get paid wonderfully, but still not have to give up our life. So we say the first chapter, and we just knock it off within the first 15 to 20 pages, what stops us? Because there are two economies that are operating in the world, Alan. We talk about the time and effort economy and the value economy. And everyone gets this intuitively. The, the time and effort economy is like the world of Rocky Balboa, right? You, you make value by staying in that ring nine to you know eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night, absorbing, punishing hours, doing the work, doing the work, doing the work. And, and, and it works to a degree, but that's not a very good model. The other economy we call it the value economy saying, hey, look, we're not getting paid for the things that we, we're not getting paid for time served. We're not getting paid for effort and hours. We're getting paid for value created and to create value I do need time, but I need my time to be different. So we knock out these, these, these chains, you know, things like the fact that we have a lack of clarity about how specifically we want our team to behave and what we want them to do. We lack strategic depth so that we have a good momentum going and all of a sudden we lose a key employee. Her husband gets transferred. I was talking to a client. They lost a key employee just today. Um, her husband got transferred. And so she left, of course, with her husband. And because of that, now he now needs to go scramble and find that person or we chase after control, or our, our time habits are, are things from 20 years ago, but the, the world today is not what it was 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So once we deal with that, we now say, okay, there's the core four-step formula, which says we're gonna embrace the value economy, which means directly and indirectly. So Alan, most people understand, hey, I'm in the value economy, of course I'm getting paid for results, but what they do though, is they manage their staff as if they lived in a time and effort economy. They push their staff to live in that time and effort world. How? You know, you send an email over to Ricardo and he responds six hours later and you get upset with him. Hey, what took so long? Well, David, I, I was working on our number one biggest problem with our number one biggest client and I turned off my email so I could focus exclusively on this, this key account. Without realizing what I've done is I've just, if I'm not careful, I push him to be accessible and reachable, but what it means is he's going to interrupt his time and his time is going to be now fractured into small slivers where no longer is he going to get his best work done. Or who do I give promotions to? The people who look like they're doing the work, the people who look like they have the best attitude versus the people who are actually creating the most value. Once I understand and just agree on that, again, we knock that out within the first 20 pages, the other 260 pages of the book are talking about things like how do I reclaim five, 10 hours a week of time I'm already working to put to upgraded uses. And then from that part, focus on the fewer better says step three, how do I make sure I know where my best leverage points for my team or for my company, for my department are? And then finally, the fourth core step is to build what we call strategic depth. And this means how do I build the company to be stronger and more independent of any one person? I mean, Alan, we've worked on this with your firm with you. I've done it for clients about they might have 
you know, in our company, Teresa is like one of our very most important team members who runs our operations. You know, how do we, how do we make sure we build the depth that other people are cross trained to cover what she does, good systems in place, strong culture. And that's the first half of the book, the core formula. The second half of the book gives five specific accelerators that makes this happen faster. Um, and so that's the, the book in a nutshell, if I were to give the five minute synopsis. Beautiful, there's a lot to it, no doubt. What applies most to a small professional firm, a five or six lawyer or five or six lawyer CPA firm? What, what sort of limiting beliefs or misconceptions will the owner of that firm typically have that this book can help unlock? Yeah, we'll give one, one easy example from the time chapter. Chapter two is about reclaiming your best time. Whenever I'm working with a professional service firm, Alan, what they're always going to say is, oh, my most important things that I do are billable work. That's my highest value use of work. And we can smile there. You and I have had conversations about that too. And yet it's not. You know, you look at non-billable versus billable, certainly that matters. And you think about Pareto's principle, the 80% is like your non-billable stuff. The 20% of billable is like that, that, that stuff that's more valuable, the 80-20 rule. But if we apply that 80-20 rule a second time and we say, okay, if 20% of what I do gives me 80% of the result, then 20% of that 20% gives me 80% of the 80%. And the book does that twice more and gives you a chart. We call it the time value matrix. And what it essentially says, you've got these A and B level things that you do that are more valuable than C time or billable work. And in a professional service firms, it would be things like determining uh, ways that you're doing your strategy and your marketing for bringing work in the door. It would include things like how can you improve the, the production system for your core your core service office. So like a law firm, how do you do your legal work? You know, I can have people doing it a certain way or I can create the system that does the work faster, more efficiently and with a higher quality um, and a higher impact for clients. It could include things like determining billing rates. It can include things like what types of work will I say yes to and what types of client will I refer out because they no longer fit our model. You know, and, and I'll give you one more in a professional service firm that almost always is an issue, collections. Every professional service firm says we don't have an issue with collections, but yet 90% of them give up 5% or more of their billable work because they have poor collections practices. And that might am amount to you know, anywhere from 10 to 15% of their profit goes up in smoke. Well, two or three hours of focused work on their collection side to improve it might mean the difference between earning a, you know, the, the senior partner in a, in a firm earning half a million or a million dollars and him or him or her earning an extra hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars more just for that three hours of extra attention and some staff time to finish out the work. That strikes me that if I could increase my profit by 150,000 in three hours, that 50,000 per hour is much more valuable than me doing three more hours at even a thousand dollars an hour. That's just simple math. Very interesting. What sort of questions will the reader typically have once they've gone through this? Yeah. You know, the, the initial thing that people are going to have, first of all, is everyone knows that we should work smarter. Everyone knows that it's a cliche. It's, it's silly. But if I probe deeper and say, okay, well, what does that specifically mean? Not everyone has an answer. And so what the book does is it gives our very best formula to operationalize concretely, specifically, behaviorally, what does it actually mean to work smarter? Things like making the decision to schedule myself differently. Like we tell our clients, you know, one day a week, you're going to block off a two to three hour block to do your high value A and B level work. So if I run a professional practice, that might be that once a week on Thursday from eight to 11, I'm going to block off a three hour block to do things like my business development work. Um, maybe it's sitting down with a staff member who's going to video me for some content that's going to go up to be from that part. Maybe it's a meeting to get booked to a conference that I'm going to go speak at that might generate $100,000 or more of billable work from that part. Yet left to our own, we let that great high value work get slivered into small little slices and get done poorly. So that's an example. Um, what else would, the, would a question commonly come up with? Well, great, I, I can create some extra time, but what should I do? What, what is the leverage point? And so in chapter three, when we talk about focus on your fewer better, what are those fewer better strategies, tactics, initiatives, behaviors 
that in your business make you or any other staff member create your highest value? What are they specifically? Um, and there's some tools to do that. And then how do you keep yourself doing those things in the face of an endless flood of emails, the face of, a, of all these interruptions from your staff members, clients who are calling and, and expecting an immediate answer? And so the book shares with that part. One more thing I'll mention, Alan, is that especially for a professional services firm, one of the most important accelerators, actually Accelerator 5, talked about in the second half of the book. We call this Leverage Better Design. And I'll, I'll laugh. I, I had a client of ours who ran a professional services firm, and he said, David, all I do all day long is deal with, with client phone calls. They just keep calling me. They keep calling me, and I laugh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend this person's name is Gloria. It's not her name, but we're going to pretend. I said, Gloria, when I call into your office, your phone tree says, press one for Gloria. <laughs> right? <laughs> and she goes, oh, so what you're saying, I should, I should make myself the last option. I said, Gloria, you could do that. That would be an improvement. But how about we take you off the phone tree altogether? And if someone wants to get a hold of you and they should get a hold of you, you give them your extension directly or for your assistant. So sometimes leveraging better design or like Alan, someone will say, I have to stay on top of my email. So they're checking their phone at night when they're with their kids, on the weekends when they're with their spouse, when they're on quote unquote vacation. They say, I, I can't miss that email, but I dig deeper. And they say, you know, I ask them, how often does that email come? They say, well, maybe that important email comes one out of every couple hundred, one out of a thousand. I say, so you're killing your entire quality of life for that one out of a thousand email. I say, here's what that sounds like. That, 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 that needle in a haystack, that one email in a thousand, you're killing your life. How can we take that needle out of the haystack completely and design the system so that your client or your staff brings that needle to you directly in that one in a thousand circumstance so that when you turn off work, you can literally turn off your email or your WhatsApp feed or your Slack channel feed or however you communicate your, your, with that part. And I'll tell you, when clients really get that, and the book tells you exactly how to do that and what's better. It's freeing because what you need is you need to make sure that for that one in a thousand situation, of course you have to handle it. Alan, I've just received service of a lawsuit. I need you. I need you. Of course I need to be able to get a hold of you. But hey, Alan, was I supposed to sign on line number one or line number two of this document? We can differentiate that. And yet most people don't. They let that one in a thousand chance kill everything versus leveraging better design to give a different mechanism to deliver that needle outside of the haystack. And that saves so much of this ongoing low level monitoring of this other stuff. And it lets me do my professional work and my business running with much more focus. And this is not just for the owner. This is for all your other professional staff and administrative staff as well, these types of ideas. Because if I can take someone who I might have as a $100,000 a year hire, and I can have them producing from X and have them even being 25% more valuable in terms of how they deliver. They become more valuable. They feel better about what they do. The firm's better for it. And the firm can even pay them a little bit more and retain them even longer. Everybody wins in that equation. That's beautiful. So, David, I want to compliment you because you've overseen a, an overhaul of our law firm's follow-up system where we've had the legal assistants, paralegals, and the lawyers who, in many cases, assist me in matters, become completely in charge of the follow-up and the tracking and the checklisting, etc. When we hand this book to my employees, what do I tell them and what do I expect them to suggest or to uh, come back with me with? or what sort of expectations are they going to have when I buy them this book and tell yeah. them, I'm excited about this book, read it, tell me how you want to improve our practice. That's right. So first of all, I'm going to frame it, Alan, as, as let's say I'm giving this book over to um, Michelle, and Michelle is one of my key people managing my, my law firm, my CPA practice, my, my medical group, whatever it might be. And I say, Michelle, you're, you're someone who is really important here, and I, I really appreciate all the work you do. Um, I read a book that meant a lot to me recently, and I thought, wow, there's some great ideas. And I realized that the only way we can get the value from this is if someone like yourself, who is such a key part of our firm, is behind what's in there. So I got a copy for you, and I really would value you to take a look at it, even if you just were reading through the first two or three chapters. 
And I, and I would like to, after you've even read through the first two or three chapters, you and I just sit down and spend 15 minutes talking. I want to see what you pull from it and see and compare notes about what I took from it versus what you took. And I'd love to just put into practice just a few of the ideas. I don't want to do everything right away because I think that would be overwhelming for you and for me. But I'd like to pull one or two ideas from the first two or three chapters that you and I are going to implement here, um, things that are going to help us create more value here for the firm, but to start moving in the direction that we do that in such a way that we can improve the quality of life for everybody here, that we can make things better so that we have a better work-life balance, so that we have better quality work delivered to our clients, so that each of us independently have a more stable work environment that we do this in. Would you be game, Michelle, to do this with me? And of course, she's going to say yes. Beautiful. David, one thing I'm really impressed with concerning your practice with Maui Mastermind is the tremendous, quick financial and personal gains that your clients come across. And I've never been able to figure out if that's because you're very selective and you only select clients who you can help so significantly right off the bat, or whether you're attracting those types of people. But as I kicked around going to self-coaching programs for 16 years before I came to you, and then kicked myself the three years thereafter since, how do you explain uh, how what you do and why having a coach can be so essential? I, I appreciate the question. I'll, I'll put it to three three quick points. So first of all, the things we can do for a client oftentimes are obvious simply because we can look at a, a hundred different clients in the same situation and see the pattern. And because we're outside with the perspective, it's not because necessarily we are brilliant or smart. I like to think our coaching team are brilliant. I like to believe that. But a lot of the, 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 the insight comes from seeing so many different businesses showcase the same pattern. And when you see it from the outside, it's, it's obvious. It's kind of like I would liken it to, Alan, if I'm in, a, in, in, in your law firm, you can look at somebody and, and, and say, you know, how can they not see these exposures that they have that we could contract away? I mean, gosh, they, they don't even have an employment contract with, with seven of their key employees. Clearly, that's a lawsuit waiting. It's obvious to you because you've seen it off a thousand clients. Well, it's obvious to us because of the same reason. And number two, we have some emotional distance from it. So, you know, we're not vested in anything other than the client being successful. So we can see it from the outside and we can say it directly. No one client of ours is, is more than a small fraction of our business. Your employees can't say it to you. Why? Because they depend on you to sign their paycheck. Um, we can say it to you because you can hear it from us because you know that our intention is to help you be a better business person. And then the final kind of comment about that is most businesses have run and gotten to a habit where they do 30% of what they do is brilliant, 30% of what they do is stupid, and somewhere in the middle, there's probably about 40% that's just so-so or variable. Well, what we do is we can just clean up the 30% that just, as soon as we shed light on it and point a better, a better picture of how to do it, it becomes obvious. And we, we are really good now, Alan, about sequencing that through. So it's not that you have to change everything at once. It's let's deal with this first. We'll see an immediate lift on bottom line or, or, or enjoyment. Then we'll deal with the next, then the next. And, and by doing it sequentially versus all at once and getting your staff involved in the implementation, that's why it happens um, as quickly as it does. So I think that would be pretty important to comment. Now, does the Freedom Formula book speak about bright, shiny objects? <laughs> sure it does. So in the chapter we talk about focus on your fewer better, which is chapter three, it's going to talk and give you two very important concrete tools to help you stay aligned. One is we call it the one page action plan, a simple tool that you can do each quarter to focus on the one, two or three most important focus areas. We even give an example a PDF template in the book for how to do that. The second tool is we call it the big rock report. It's a tool that you can use to weekly hold your yourself and your other key people in your company. And yet new and fresh. They like new and different versus staying with the same old, same old day after day. Well, you had the screen uh, freeze when you said person in your company. Got it. 
So the person in your company, you are a key person in your company who has a challenge about being scattered or, or, or pulled the bright, shiny objects. Those are two specific tools in the book that talk about how to maintain your best focus of you and your key staff on those fewer things that make a difference every 90 days and every week. They're, they're, those are the two key units of time. The quarter to make the decisions of what to focus on and the weekly decisions of the two or three things to do with your discretionary time, which might only be three or four hours an entire week. So I have to be very judicious about where I invest that three to four hour block. And if I invest it in the right things, that three or four hour block can, can mean five, 10, $20,000 or more for my company, for my firm, if I put it to the right things. Beautiful. So David, with the book coming out today, I know how important it is to get sales on opening day. Yeah. And I think you indicated you have some sort of a special for the people who have watched this uh, video today. Absolutely. So first of all, we, we hope they're going to enjoy the book at any time. They can get it at any of their local booksellers. So if they want to support their local bookstore and get it there, if they want to go online to Amazon or Barnes and Noble, please go ahead and get a copy for you and for your key staff. Get, go ahead and do that there from that. You do that by September 10th and just simply email my, my staff at bonus at MauiMastermind.com. That's bonus at MauiMastermind.com. And what's going to happen is not only will you get the book and the other goodies that come with it, but you're also going to get a brand new tool that we created called the five profit levers. And especially if you run a professional services firm, this tool is a six page PDF that comes with an hour and 10 minute video. That's myself and actually a good friend, one of uh, our fellow Maui advisors, Kevin Bassett, CPA, walking through how can you make your firm more profitable? It does apply to other businesses as well, but if you're a professional services firm, it's gonna apply even more. And it goes through five levers that you can pull to make any business more profitable. And these are things that are really important, simple leverage places to really increase that. And so by, you know, get the book, and go ahead and email it to our company, the, the receipt, or just email that you've got it. We'll be on the honor system here. And we'll go ahead and get back with a response to you and get you the link for you to download the PDF and the video. And this is not available anywhere else. I'm, I, actually, it is available in the $1,600 or $1,700 home study course. But this particular video we pulled from that course, and I think your, your clients who get the book for them and for their staff are going to absolutely love it. So they just get their copy by the 10th email bonus at MauiMastermind.com and they get the great value from the book and they get the PDF tool and the video uh, as an additional bonus to say you, thank you. Yeah, when you talk about A time, B time, and C time, spending three or four hours at least every 60 to 90 days watching a video like that that I know must be wonderful with you and Kevin is yeah. really essential for any business to keep their bearings. That's right. And for any viewers, if you uh, didn't get that email address, you can email me at agasman at gasmanpa.com, and I'll be glad to, to pass it on to David. So, David, any final words for us? I really thank you for sharing this book today, uh, for all you've done for our law firm and for me and for many of our clients, and for all humanity with all these books that you've published. What, what are your final words for this program? Yeah, I appreciate that. What I want to share with somebody is we all know we should work smarter. I hope they use some of these ideas to actually in practice do the working smarter. My real mission, my real goal is how, how do you fall in love with your business again for the, the people it employs, the value it creates, the freedom you enjoy, the profits it generates for all the right reasons with that. And I think that you can build an extraordinary business. There's just some small little tweaks that you make along the way. And you go from someone who's a great professional to someone who runs a great professional practice. And the difference is subtle, but the difference is I create more value in the world and have a life at the same time. I can be there for the people who matter. And I, I send the right message to my staff that they can do incredible work and have a life. And that's what we want for them both. Beautiful. Well, you've certainly uh, set a fantastic example with your company, Maui Mastermind, and with your coaching and with your publishing. So thanks very much. Thanks to everybody for attending this webinar today. And may the rest of your day be billable, if not a <laughs>
thank you very much for any and all questions, comments, or suggestions that you may have. I am the brains behind the operation, and if there are any criticisms whatsoever, please send them to Gassman. He earned them all. Thank you very much, and we will see you next week. Goodbye.